Paul Panel for the UW Madison Center for Journalism and Ethics. Um, we are here um, to talk about the border and beyond, so ethics issues and immigration reporting. Uh, before we get going, I would like to offer up a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you to our sponsor for tonight, um, Perkins Cooey. We really appreciate the, their support. It's not just support, but enthusiastic support to make this panel possible tonight. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, especially Lindsay Palmer, who's up here in the front, uh, who is an affiliated faculty member in the Center for Journalism and Ethics. Um, I have to say, it is really rewarding to do work like we do in a place that supports it um, so wonderfully. Uh, they've just been fantastic. Uh, we also have two promotional sponsors who helped us out this year, the Wisconsin State Journal and the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, on the way out, you can um, pick up some um, literature from them as well as the Society for Society of Professional Journalists, I hope my mouth is not broken all night long, uh, as well as um, we have some ethics materials from uh, one of our panelists that are out there for you um, on your way out. Um, I'd like to thank over here um, on my left and your right, our student fellows here from the Center for Journalism and Ethics. One of the missions of the center is to bring ethics to life for students who are interested in journalism and other media industries. Um, so one of the opportunities that they have to do that is um, through our fellows program. So I see some nice young faces in the room. Keep that in mind for uh, future years. It comes with really interesting engagement with guests like we have tonight. Also comes with a little bit of money. And then finally, uh, a giant thank you to Christy Eastman, um, who runs the Center for Journalism and Ethics. She has been just an amazing, amazing sounding board and planner for all of this. Would not have been possible without her. So, without further ado, without further thanks, let me get rolling. I'd like to introduce to you here tonight our distinguished panel of three uh, who have come to explore what I know are going to be difficult issues. Um, and I know they're issues on which a lot of people have some pretty solidified opinions. Um, one of the things we encourage people to do with anything involving the center is to do your best to open your mind to perspectives that you may not have considered. Um, so uh, we're going to um, offer some challenging viewpoints tonight, maybe some things that reinforce your worldview, but maybe some things that would encourage you to change. So here at the center, uh, visiting us all this week as a um, journalist in residence at the Center for Journalism and Ethics is Caitlin Dickerson from the New York Times. Caitlin is um, the national immigration reporter for the Times, and she's based in New York, but doesn't stay there a lot. <laughs> she's on the move um, all the time. Since she joined the Times in 2016, she's broken uh, a lot of different stories about the Trump administ administration's immigration policies, including um, family separation, immigrant arrests and deportation, lately uh, quite a bit of focus on asylum practices, as well as, as, well as health and safety standards within our immigration um, apparatus. If you're a listener of The Daily or a watcher of The Weekly, you have heard and or seen Caitlin. She's a frequent guest. I never miss it when she uh, appears um, on The Daily. She's also um, filled in as host as well. She, um, Caitlin is a multi-award winning journalist. She's earned a George um, Foster Peabody Award and an Edward R. Murrow Award for her reporting, and she's a two-time finalist for um, the Lindsay, excuse me, Livingston Award. Before joining the Times, her investigative reporting at NPR led to the creation of a 2017 law providing compensation to American veterans who had been used in secret experiments with mustard gas that were conducted by the U.S. military. Um, we've been just delighted to have Caitlin with us this week, and I know there are a lot of students in the room who have benefited from conversations with her. Uh, to Caitlin's right, we have Armando Ibarra from our own beloved UW-Madison, uh, where he's an associate professor in the Department of Labor Education. He serves as director of the Chicanx and Latinx Studies Program, as well as faculty Latino specialist for the Division of Extension at UW-Madison. He's an affiliated faculty member in the Labor Center at UMass Amherst, and he earned his PhD in political science from the University of California, Irvine, and a master's in public administration and a BA in sociology and Spanish. He's got a lot of letters after his name, a great deal of education there. His research and fields of specialization are Mexican, Mexican-American, uh, working communities, social movements, community development, international labor migration, and community-based participatory applied research. That's especially uh, important to the Center for Journalism and Ethics because we do try to do a lot connecting academic research with the communities that are affected by it. So uh, he's gonna be a great guest with us tonight. And then, uh, 
Closest to me here is Nissa Ree, who comes from 90 Days, 90 Voices. She's an award-winning journalist and executive director of that nonprofit. It's an immigration news outlet that was started in response to um, some very fast changes in immigration policy uh, with the Trump administration, and uh, began as a very sort of short-term idea, and then expanded now into a 501c3 nonprofit news organization. In over uh, a decade in journalism, Nissa has covered global issues as a producer at Chicago Public Radio, served as a foreign correspondent in South Korea and Vietnam, and reported on police abuse and gun control um, in Chicago. Those are not small issues in Chicago. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in international studies from the University of Queensland. So she's traveled the world over, lots of long plane flights there. So I would like to thank all three of you for being with us, and let's get this conversation started, shall we? All right, just remember, what's up I'd like to start by laying a little bit of groundwork and popping a more general question um, to each of, each of you on the panel. You can go in whatever order you like. Um, so I went back, as I was preparing for this, I went back to when I first started as director of the Center for Journalism and Ethics. I created this kind of hot list of burning issues that I really felt the center had to explore in the three-year term that I was going, that I hoped that I would be there. Um, and I went back and I looked at that burning issues list, and immigration wasn't on it. There were lots of things that we've explored in our programming, but immigration wasn't there. And uh, Krista can attest that in June, when we were looking at this coming calendar year, I said I have one and only one issue that we're going to explore in the fall. The journalists in residence and our panel have to be focused on immigration. So my question to you is, I mean, maybe I was just dumb and didn't recognize it three, four years ago, but. Why are we where we are today? Why is integration such a key issue um, for us, both in, in terms of news media coverage and news media consumption by the public? Where are we and why are we here? Okay, I'll go first. So I think the first and the most obvious reason, of course, is that we're in the midst of an administration that is making major, in many cases, unprecedented changes to immigration policy on a near daily basis. Uh, my sleep schedule can attest to it. Um, but stepping back a little bit further, why are we here? And, and a lot of the stuff that I end up writing about and that gets a lot of attention now, um, quite frankly, you know, dates back, completely predates the Trump administration, in many cases predates the Obama administration. So the conversations that the country is having now are in many ways a long time coming. And there were moments, you know, in during the Obama administration, dur during the George W. Bush administration, when there were national conversations about comprehensive immigration reform. They never went anywhere, but I remember them because I, you know, I was left at the altar covering those issues multiple times, and, and you know, could very well be again uh, under the next administration if there is a change in 2020. So there are so many reasons leading up to, to where we are now. Uh, I think that demographic changes are obviously a huge one in this country. Economic changes are obviously a huge one in the ways in which those link to, to people's feelings about immigrant communities. Um, this is all very well, well researched and in many ways it's a repetition of patterns uh, that we've seen in the United States and in other countries before. I, you know, I wrote recently a story that had to do with um, the uh, immigration laws that basically were replaced during 1965 um, the quota system that the United States had in the past that set demographic limits for a number of people who could come into the United States based on country and replaced it with a family reunification system. But, but that system it was openly described by the senators who created it and pushed it through Congress as one that was intended to continue more immigration of primarily people from from Europe, and, and the opposite, of course, happened, spurring massive demographic change in this country. So in many ways, you can look back to 1965 and, and also use that as a, a way to think about how we got to where we are now. Yeah. I think I, I would agree, you know, obviously the Trump administration has a lot to do with why we're talking about this so much. Uh, but also globally, we are in the largest displacement crisis the world has ever seen. Uh, you know, the number of people displaced from their homes because of conflict or climate change globally is a huge number. So that is, that's a real trend. 
Uh, also, you know, I think it's also who is who are we talking about when we're talking about like news coverage and media cons consumption? Because there's people who have cared about these issues for decades. You know, in my hometown in Chicago, we love Obama, but also he was known as the deporter in chief. You know, there are, people have been working around these issues of immigration change and policies for decades, and. Um, Really, the difference now we're seeing is mainstream press are paying more attention a lot, I feel, due to this global uh, crisis issue, but also President Trump's rhetoric around these issues, and also the challenging of certain narratives about who immigrants are. So, you know, you saw under Obama, uh, we had DACA, and then when that was challenged, I think we saw some outrage where the perfect immigrant, the student who came here to study at college, now their status was at risk. Uh, and I think that really spoke to people and outraged people in a way that uh, deportations or putting people's status at risk previously may not have captured the imagination of, of the public or of people uh, who read the mainstream press. So I think there's a confluence of these factors that are working together to make this such, a, you know, the, the issue of the moment. Armando, as our non-journalist on the panel, bringing that perspective from outside of the practices that a lot of us are used to, what do you see? Why are we here now? Well, I think that we've been here for a long time. Um, those folks that are involved in social movements or, or, those, or those immigrant communities that we call have been around um, even in Wisconsin for at least 100 years. Uh, so that's, that's part of the, the, the larger area up here. I think what we have right now is a moment we're having a crisis in humanity and how we treat people and really are, are in this hyper state of, um, of, of racialization of newcomers, unlike we haven't seen since the 1920s. Um, there's some great academic work out there that talks about these narratives, these discourses, that shaped public policy all the way from the 20s when many argued that's when the, the illegal alien, the construct of the illegal alien was created to the 60s, when we start 60s, 70s, and 80s, when we start talking about this invasion, um, this invasion from, from, from the North, right? Um, so we've been here for a long time. Those of us that, that have been a part outside of the academy uh, with social mobility organizations know that that there's been a lot of organizing that's been going on by both uh, immigrant, immigrant rights social movement organizations and their allies. Um, you know, not too long ago in 2006, this was the topic of conversation when at that point in history we had the single largest uh, protest for, for comprehensive immigration reform. So what we see today is really the, I think, the, the, the pinnacle of, uh, of of how we're, of a human rights crisis that we're having in our country. When we have children locked up, when we have set family separation, when we have profiteering based on, on, uh, on suffering of people, and I think it, it's something that's started to resonate to get across to all of us with, with regards to who we are as a country. I'd like to turn our attention to, to journalists. So, so news media, uh, whether those would be traditional or more challenging sources. Uh, what are some of the concerns you each have about news media practices um, when it comes to the coverage of, of immigration? Um, if you ran the world, what would we be doing differently to, to be better? Sure, I think that in covering immigration, it requires cutting through um, political rhetoric Across, across the political spectrum, really, and, and figuring out what you're talking about. I mean, I've talked about this in a few different classes on campus this week, but basically I think that I'm really interested in fake news and misinformation, and I feel like immigration is a kind of ground zero for both, because it's an issue that people are incredibly passionate about, but also one that's incredibly complex, difficult to understand, 
difficult to talk about in short sound bites, in headlines, in press releases. And I think politicians really take advantage of that. And I've seen it in my career done by the Trump administration. I've seen it done by the Obama administration. I've seen it done, as you said, in many ways, going back to the 1920s. And so it requires extra work to make sure that you're reporting things accurately and clearly. I mean, just, I think it was yesterday, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security Kevin McElhinney declared an end to catch and release. I want to say that was the fifth time that the Trump administration has declared an end to catch and release <laughs> since you know, the president has been in office. And they sent out this press release that many people wrote up almost verbatim, really misleading the public because what happened was a minor change, and I'll explain it to you, just to give you a sense of how finicky and kind of annoying it is to get immigration coverage right, and this is why you see it done wrong so often. So. Uh, up until last summer, families who crossed the border and requested asylum and ended up being detained, they were transferred from Border Patrol custody, which is the law enforcement agency that, um, that really stands along the southern line of the country and the northern line as well, um, and the eastern and the western, but they, they, they are the first line of defense, catching people as they come into the United States and holding people, hopefully temporarily, in processing facilities. And the Border Patrol would then transfer anybody who is a in their custody to ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which deals with long-term detention. And ICE, because we have very limited family detention space in this country, would give those families an NTA, it's a notice to appear, and tell the families when to come back for court. This is how it always worked. But what happened was these facilities, you're already bored, I mean, this is why, why people don't do it right. So the, uh, over the summer, there were so many families coming in that there wasn't, basically there was, there were huge backups and people were getting stuck in these facilities where conditions were of huge concern because there wasn't room in Border Patrol facilities to hold on to them. ICE couldn't move quickly enough to, to take them from Border Patrol over to their facilities only to give them the NTA and ultimately release them. And so there was this pressure on the Border Patrol, why don't you just give them the NTAs? Why don't you guys just release them so that we don't have to wait for them to get in one vehicle to another to go to the new facility? So here's what Kevin McElhinney and changed yesterday. Rather than Border Patrol continuing to release families and give them notices to appear, he changed his mind and went back to the way the process had been for the prior 30 years so that instead, now, now because there are fewer families, they're going to have to wait to get the NTA and they're going to go back into ICE custody before they end up being released. This whole process takes, on average, 24 to 72 hours and they're going to be released, and they're going to come back into court in the same way that they were before. I mean, you're confused, right? But, it, but what I'm saying is that basically it's the same as it was before, with, with the one difference being that it might, might take 72 hours to be released rather than 24 hours. So it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's a minor change. But the way that it's announced is that catch and release is over. But catch and release is over. So you really, it takes a lot of extra work as a journalist. And then just to give you an example very quick from the prior administration, I promise it's a lot shorter. You know, President Obama used to talk about how he felt that you know, immigrants when coming to the United States needed to get in line, they needed to wait their turn and enter the United States in a fair way. Problem is that often when he would talk about that, he was referring to immigrants coming from Mexico or immigrants coming from Central America who didn't have family ties in the United States and were coming here for work. So there was literally no line for them to get in. So I just want to, I mean, it's one of many, many, many examples to give you a sense of how on a routine basis, politicians describe immigration policies and immigration practices in ways that are completely inaccurate and it is extra work on journalists, which is why I think so often it's not done right. And I think that raises one of the sort of you know, crises in journalism, particularly in the local news, <laughs> that, um, is that there are fewer people doing that, that doing more work. <laughs> so there are fewer people who have subject matter expertise reporting on immigration now than ever before. And, and it's not like the problems have lessened, the problems have, have amplified. Uh, but you know, it's not like some publisher wakes up and says, in the morning, like, let me get this wrong today that outlet doesn't have someone with that subject matter expertise that would tell them, oh, this press release is not, it, it is framed incorrectly. That's right. I mean, it, the, these processes that I'm describing, the reporting and the research, it takes a lot of resources. And it's, it's such a shame that so many outlets, those that exist still, right, many are, are gone completely, but those that exist are strapped and they're overworked. And, but I think that you know, the same rules apply, whether your newsroom is one with three people or with 300 people. 
you can't publish stories that are inaccurate. And so I think that as a result, what would be better would be to limit the amount of stories that you're trying to cover, the topics that you're trying to cover, and to do those things right than to mislead people. I feel like there's more harm done by misleading people, especially now, uh, but probably always, than, than just skipping it and leaving it to, unfortunately, the national outlets that have the resources to do it. Armando, from the perspective of labor or social movements or anything that you want to focus on, where do you see news media going wrong when it comes to their reporting on immigration? I don't know how many times I've seen, especially TV news media, the same person jumping the fence. Um, <laughs> the same person jumping the fence over and over. You know, the portrayal of, of, of that, uh, of, of those, of these people that are coming over, what we know is, is, is quite, it's quite the opposite, right? We know that the majority of folks that are here are here um, legally, right? And we're talking about immigrants. Of the 44 million plus um, immigrants that are in, in our country right now, we know that the vast majority are here legally, the vast majority immigrated um, probably to be with family, right? And um, we know that we focus on, on the Mexican immigrant, now the Central American migration, we start calling these folks the caravans, all 8,000 of these folks, okay? Um, and so it's, it's amplified, right? Of, of, those, uh, of those 10 and a half million unauthorized folks here in, in our country right now, the, the vast majority are from Mexico. Um, but it's a, a declining number that doesn't get that attention that it deserves. So facts matter, right? And uh, we have some, some wonderful demographers and some wonderful social scientists that have given us those facts that, that usually get distorted uh, in these visualizations of, of gang members, you know, coming over to, to do harm or, 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 or uh, somebody jumping some fence somewhere, which is preposterous. We know that apprehensions at the, at the border are down. We know that net migration from Mexico is actually down. So that means that there's more people leaving than coming at this point. Um, so it's important to have these these, these good information to, to be able to do that. From the point of social movements, um, I often, one, of, one of the frustrations that, that I see is that when we see um, 50,000 people, for example, protest at this state capitol um, for, for, um, because of the intent of passing anti, what are seen to be anti-immigrant laws, you get the same amount of press coverage for those 50,000 people that you do for those 10 anti protests um, so the so the balance with regards to to the coverage itself, and it's important because it creates that discourse that we all get. So you see 50,000 people, 10 people, and each of them is going to get that 30 second on the news media outlet, or the same amount of of, uh, of, of print on on their stories. And and I think that's disempowering. And it, and I think it it really feeds into this national narrative or this national discourse that's used to pass these types of uh, policies or laws that, that really go, in my, in my estimation, against who we are as a country. And so what are some of the concerns you have? Yeah, well, I would like to you know, echo Caitlin's you know, thoughts about not thinking about history enough. Uh, and also Armando's thoughts about the nuances of immigrants and who they are. They're not just the person having the fence, right? So, you know, as a news outlet in Chicago, we realize our resources are limited. Our focus is mostly on personal narratives. And I think that's a, a spot where journalists really have a challenge in covering an immigration and doing it well and safely. We've seen too many times TV journalists or news reporters coming into a community, getting clips, and not explaining to people what their rights are as someone who's being interviewed. You don't have to talk to the press. You don't have to go on record. And what are the implications if you do go on record? You know, we know that ICE is picking up people based on news reports and people talking to reporters and being quoted or being photographed. We know that it can put someone's asylum case at risk if you are quoted saying something that goes against your asylum case. And you know, even photography, if someone's life is in danger, having your face up on the internet or on TV can be problematic and put people's lives in danger, people who, you know, whose safety we should be prioritizing as journalists. 
Uh, so I would like to see more conversation around those issues. How do we bring in personal narratives? How do we bring in the nuance of immigrant stories uh, in a safe manner and protecting people? And you know, at 90 Days, 90 Voices, we've done this a number of different ways. One way is you know always thinking about how do we uh, protect someone who may be in danger? So that might be using an illustration instead of a photograph or using a pseudonym or someone's first name. Uh, it might be reading back a quote that might, you know, again, conflict with their asylum case or be problematic. So giving them more leeway than you would say when I'm interviewing uh, a judge or interviewing a police officer, someone who truly understands how the media works and what are the implications of talking to a journalist. So uh, that's something that I'd like to be seeing, you know, other journalists taking on, um, thinking through those issues of safety. So the two, the, Armando and Nissa, you raised two things that we spent a lot of time wrestling with um, in journalism ethics. And so one is this idea of false equivalence that we're, we're taking, and all the students are nodding, like, yeah, that was on last week's quiz, right? <laughs> the idea that we're taking things that are not equal and, and forcing them to be equal. And, and sometimes that's just, just the constraints of journalism. You know, a 90 second TV news package, are you really going to be able to represent that weight? But it's something that I think, uh, I, I'm guessing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've actually gotten better at in journalism. Um, you know, some really self-reflective discussions I think have led to that. Maybe not as much in, in the immigration space as in, say, the climate science space, but it's a, it's a daily struggle in newsrooms. And then the other is minimizing harm. And that's, uh, you know, it's this tenet of journalism ethics. Journalism can do a lot of harm. You know, you can ruin reputations with a story. Um, you can highlight someone's personal struggle and accidentally uh, reveal that person's identity to someone they're trying to flee. Um, journalism is not easy to do. I will never defend the bad stuff, but I will always try to explain the difficulties that are inherent in this. So I, I also like to say journalism ethics ain't just for journalists anymore. Um, it's something that I think we need to uh, think about, not just the practices that happen within industry, but how it's received by consumers of information. And so I'd like to turn to that now and get your thoughts on uh, what do we, as the public, get wrong? What, what do we misunderstand? Even if you could have all the Caitlin Dickersons in the world doing all the nuanced reporting on immigration, what do we still screw up? And Nissa, how about we start with you? What's, what's what's the what do, what does the public misunderstand about, about immigration? It doesn't have to be the process of immigration, but just the situation that we're in today. What do people mess up? Yeah, I, I would really go back to the, the idea of nuance. That, you know, often we think of about, when we say immigrant, we mean undocumented Mexican immigrant jumping the fence. Or we mean something very explicit. We mean an asylum seeker. When really, you know, 20% of Chicago's population was not born in the United States. It's an extremely diverse group. And it's not just a group that, you know, is at the border. Immigration stories are not just at the border. Cook County, this county that Chicago's in, has the third highest number of foreign-born people in the United States, twice as much as El Paso. Um, so it's a real issue in the Midwest. Whoops. And, um, you know, I think just trying to broaden our understanding of why people are coming, who are these people that are coming, um, it's not one story. And not everyone's good, not everyone's bad. Trying to get really that nuance that, you know, uh, is missing in a lot of stories because they're shorter, or, you know, because we need to try to do a better job of that. Uh, is something, you know, I, as an audience, as a reader, reader, I would really press you to, to learn more about that. Learn about the, who the people are who are coming, why are they coming, um, and challenge some of the the media's narrative, uh, or, or society's narrative, about who immigrants are. Come on up, you look like you have something to ask that. You know, it's often that, that we, we, when we talk about immigration in particular, you know, it's a very complex situation, we assume that, that people are coming because they want to come, you know? And, and uh, there's, there's something called the right to stay home, the right not to migrate, and um, that's something that's not part of these national understandings of, of the current context of immigration. Um, I, you know, one of the things that, 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 I, 
that I always talk about is very few people wake up and say, today is the day I'm going to leave my home. I'm going to leave my family. Today is the day I'm going to track to the border and walk 10 days across this desert, risk death, to work some low pay job where I'm going to be exploited. Um, so there's, there's those narratives that I think are part of this, but also to understand that we as a country are complicit in creating the conditions for mass migration of folks from around the world to our country. So I think there's some mass education that needs to take place where we understand, you know, that trees like that, uh, that programs like the Bracero program, that the H-2A uh, temporary worker programs that are, that are um, helping or intervening in democratically elected governments also cause displacement and ultimately internal migration and immigration into the U.S. So those are some of the things that, that, that I think uh, as the public, we get quite wrong often. Yes. <laughs> Caitlin? I'll just add that I try to be sympathetic to the public. I recognize that people have busy lives. They have full-time jobs. They're taking care of families. They're taking care of themselves. And so, of course, my advice as a journalist and somebody who reads everything skeptically is you should all read everything skeptically and you should exercise common sense, and you should report out on the reporting that you're reading. But I also, I, I, I feel bad giving that advice because I know it's not practical or realistic for so many people, and so it's hard for me to know what the solution is. You know, I've given a few examples of bad information that's out there. I also think on a very basic level, just to give you a very specific example in the immigration space right now, Many people, I won't attempt to ask for a show of hands, but I won't at this moment, but you know, many people, uh, because of the way that it's talked about, think that the vast majority of families who cross the border, perhaps the vast majority of families who are separated, had broken the law, um, had done something illegal. People think that seeking asylum is now illegal, and it's because of the oversimplified way in which these these issues are covered and written about. I mean, we just don't have time for that very long-winded and whining explanation like the one that I gave about detention earlier that probably half of you fell asleep during. But, but seeking asylum is not an illegal act, uh, whether you cross at a port of entry or even if you cross between ports of entry. I mean, that's just a very basic and small concrete example. There are so many that I could give. Um, I think the reality, unfortunately, in the short term is that you do have to be skeptical of everything that you read. You do have to exercise your common sense. You do have to cross-reference your sources. Hopefully you can find some sources that you feel like you can trust and rely on. Hopefully I'm one of them. But I think it's okay if I'm not. You know, I think everybody has to choose, choose for yourself. But we're in an environment now where everybody needs to be a little bit more aware and a little bit more skeptical. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. One of the things that really strikes me, particularly today, uh, when it comes to immigration reporting, is the ethics of, of language, of narrative, of framing. You know, the difference between family migration, linked migration, and chain migration. Uh, you know, just different frame on each, and that matters. Uh, what, what strikes you about language and narrative today? What are some of the challenges that you guys face um, in reporting, Nissa and Caitlin and then Armando? What are some of the frames you change? Oh, the frame. Probably the most important thing that, that I'd like to talk about when, when I talk about how we talk about immigrants or just people in general. You know, there's a, there's, there's a real frame that's employed for, for, for immigrants of today, right? And I think this frame is, is it's tried, it's true, and it's, and it's been used for at least 100 years. Um, and that frame is, is that the immigrant that's coming from south of the border is the criminal, right? What else? The unkempt, drunkard that's coming here to steal your benefits and your jobs. So that, that is the frame that we often have to, and now the gang member, right? Now when we start talking about, about folks from Central America, now we have this other layered frame. So when we read, when I read papers and, and I start seeing the word illegal, right, that is a trigger for me to say, okay, this is a trigger that's going to trigger these media frames with regards to these people that are coming, um, that, are, that are newcomers to, to our country or are trying to be newcomers to our country. So really 
trying to, um, I thought we had this conversation about, I don't know, was it five, six, ten years ago, about the I word, uh, about the illegal word in uh, referring to people in, in media, uh, because it does really for, trigger those frames, I think, and it triggers those ideas in many of us that do, that don't have the time to really study or, or be real nuanced about how we think about people we think are that different than us. Um, and we can get into a whole deep conversation here about, about racialization in the media, but um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we, we did 10, 15 years ago have that conversation. It led to the Associated Press, which has sort of the dominant style um, in journalism, making a change, you know, saying not to use illegal immigrants, going with undocumented, un unauthorized, or suggest suggested alternatives. But that was not an uncontroversial decision. It, they met with a lot of blowback, and the blowback was, well, a lot of people are here illegally. And the, the AP's point, which I thought was, was nuanced and good, was, well, you don't know. <laughs> you can't make an assumption. Why would you make a broad brush assumption um, about criminality when you don't, you just don't know the situation. So it was, again, trying to minimize the harm of, of the word while still, still telling, telling that truth. What other words matter? What other frames matter? I think the fact that we have so many catchphrases, basically the politicians love to create catchphrases about immigration is really a reflection of the fact that it's an issue that people are passionate about but that they don't totally understand, like I brought up earlier, you know, and not just illegal versus undocumented, but things like I said, like catch and release, which really doesn't make sense in many ways. Things like getting in line, um, things like, you know, as, illegal with regard to seeking asylum, which is a legal process. I mean, there are so many, um, there are so many falsehoods and, and that are uh, perpetuated because they make catchy phrases that are, that are memorable and they stick in your mind and they speak to your emotions and they speak to your preconceived notions, whatever they are. Republicans do it, Democrats do it uh, so frequently. And so for me, I know what I try to do is actually try not to use any of this language. I mean, a lot of people might not like this, but I, in my stories, avoid labeling anyone as either an undocumented or an illegal immigrant. I try to be as specific and clear and descriptive as possible, and if I catch myself even thinking a phrase that I hear a Republican or Democratic politicians using, I try to just completely take it out of the story and just be clear and just be frank. So if I'm labeling a person, it tends to be unauthorized, but I, I actually avoid, generally speaking, labeling people at all when I talk about what they've done. And so sometimes that, that does mean crossing the border illegally right? because there's a law that exists. I, I, you know, I realize that a lot of people don't like that decision, but when as a question of accuracy, um, to me that's true. So I, I avoid labeling people, but I, and I just feel like I'm allergic to uh, all of the catchphrases that politicians use across the political spectrum. I try to just be clear and be descriptive and just avoid those things as much as possible. Just quickly, illegal, you know, illegal, Ill, illegal and illegal, uh, I can't wait, illegal is really just a socially constructed frame that we use to refer to people. Uh, it, it, it's really, a, I think it's, a, it's very harmful in many ways. When we talk about crossing the border, we know that it's been turned into misdemeanor. In here in the, in the recent past, but before it was, it was, um, it wasn't an illegal act to cross the border, no more so than driving, you know, over the speed limit on, at, on some sort of highway or what have you. Um, these are these are very socially constructed frames that that, that I think uh, have have impacts on the way we think about about people. So one of the things that we try to do a lot in the center is get out of our little ivory tower and get out of industry and do more interacting with the public and, and hearing concerns. And so, you know, I'll go to a church meeting or the Madison Senior Center or whatever it happens to be and have these conversations about journals. So the number one thing I get hit with is bias. Everybody is biased. And so, uh, Caitlin, I want to I want to turn to you first on this one because I imagine what one of the so we invited you as a guest, and I will tell you, I got critiques about that decision from the right and from the left. 
Um, so, you know, the idea that, oh, she's so liberally biased, she can't report on, say, the Trump administration, oh, she's so pro-Trump, she gives them a free pass on this and that. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I, not, not throngs of people, but, but you know, people raising yeah, concerns. I know. I know. And I you know them well, I'm sure, I'm sure you get it, for virtually every story that you write in this space is controversial and across the political spectrum. How do you deal with that in your daily practice? What do you do in response to that? I try to engage with people as much as possible. I mean, I got into journalism because I became really passionate about the role of a free and fair and independent press that is as objective as possible. I know we're, we're not really using the O word now anymore these days. And, and recognizing that I'm a human being that has thoughts and has feelings. I mean, as long as I've kind of been an adult with a political mind, it's been one that um, has identified as somebody who wants to give people the facts in as straight a possible way I possibly can so that they can come up with their own opinions. Um, it's not that I don't have opinions, but it's that that's, that's the role that I feel that I have and that I'm passionate about um, taking on. And so, um, you know, you, you used to joke, even five years ago, you used to joke that if you wrote a story and it upset both Republicans and Democrats and you were doing your job right, I think that's still true to a certain extent, but we're in a very different moment, and, and it's it's worth sort of pausing on. Um, the publisher of the New York Times wrote uh, an op-ed earlier this week that I think is worth taking a look at, and, and real ways in which um, the current uh, administration has, has changed um, the role of, of journalists and the, uh, the role of journalists that journalists play in our democracy. Um, but that, you know, notwithstanding, what I do is try to engage as much as possible, again, because my goal here is to try to help people understand each other better, and in some cases that even means help people, helping people understand journalists better. So I spend a lot of time, far more than ever before, when I'm out in the field reporting, just explaining to people in a very basic way what my job is, what the rules I have to follow are, what my process is, uh, what I'm here to do, what I'm not here to do. You know, I can't make up quotations, and I have no interest in doing that. I won't publish something that's going to surprise you if you're a source in my story. You'll always know what's going to be published before it goes up on our website or on the daily or on the weekly. I mean, these are the basic things that people don't know. I was just talking in a class earlier today about how, you know, we as journalists in decades past enjoyed a lot of faith that the public had in us, a real trust, because we were sort of baked in as an institution in this democracy in a way that's being questioned now. But what I'm learning is that it was in many ways a blind faith, that people did trust journalists, but they didn't know why, because if they did, then we wouldn't be having the conversations that we are right now. And so it's time to rebuild, and I'm, I'm trying to look at it as an opportunity, though it has added many hours onto my day. <laughs> so Nissa, I'm interested in a newer organization like yours that, that was you know, sort of born out of a cause-related idea. Do you come at the journalism that you do with a particular viewpoint, and, and what is that? And do, do you see your work as advocacy journalism in any way, or do you see it as this sort of, um, you know, neutral, fair, we're not using the objective, or, um, but how do you characterize what you do, and does, is it differentiated from mainstream outlets? Yeah, so we're a 501c3 nonprofit, so which means we can't be an advocacy or a partisan group, you know, by law. Uh, we are owned by the people, that's what a nonprofit means. Uh, so, no, we're not partisan, we're not advocacy. Do we have a, a per point of view in that we cover certain things rather than others? Certainly, I would think mo any media outlet does. Um, I, I really come at this issue, though, of objectivity. Um, it, my thinking has really evolved over the years when I started out in public radio. You know, it was to the point where they told us you're not allowed to vote in primaries because that your name is on a ballot then and everyone knows you're a Democrat or Republican um, and you're not allowed to go to rallies as a citizen or parades. Um, and you know, obviously I think a lot of that has changed. A lot of thinking around that has changed. And part of, you know, things that I'm hopeful around this idea of objectivity as a point of view is the movement towards solutions journalism and also the Australian movement towards peace journalism, which I recommend everyone looks up if you haven't had a chance. Uh, and that's really inquiring what is the role of a journalist 
and looking at the role journalists have played in promoting conflicts and wars in the past and what, what we can do to kind of step back and say we have this power, where can we create spaces for dialogue and understanding? Um, and so that's really where I'm coming from, thinking about ways that we can promote understanding and dialogue through our reporting. Um, I think a lot of outlets do a great job on the policy issues, um, like Kate was saying, but like that's not our focus. Our focus is really on the human side and on um, how is this impacting you know, individuals and communities. For those of you in the audience who aren't familiar with the term solutions journalism, it comes out of some, some pretty persuasive research uh, that when uh, we present a social problem in news coverage, um, people can feel pretty you know, battered down by that. They feel like they don't, you know, there's no, there's no way out of this dark hole of, say, poverty uh, that we're facing. But when it's presented, when the, the social problem is presented, wrapped in some effort to address it, uh, people actually feel more efficacious. They feel like they can do things in their community to solve the problems they face, and and so it's a it's a nascent movement, uh, but it's it's gaining some uh, gaining some steam and certainly interesting, very interesting. When you said peace journalism, I looked back at my fellows like that's a story we're going to write. <laughs> so look for that on our Ethics Center website. Um, so. There are a lot, there's a lot of darkness when we're talking about this kind of reporting. You know, there's family separation, there are people who have died uh, trying to cross across a border, there's um, a lot of polarization of viewpoints. Um, but let's be glasses half full for a second here. Where are each of you optimistic in the immigration space? Where, where can we find, where the, a lot of young people in this room, where can they find hope um, about where we are today? And you've got to say something. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cliche that, you know, I'm always hopeful in the next generation. Um, and, I, and I think that, uh, but I'm also a, a really hopeful in this generation as well. I think that as a country, uh, we've, uh, we're, we're, we're in a space right now that, that, that I don't think can get any more difficult than what it is. Don't jinx it. I think that the, 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 the hope for me is the, the ability to have these types of conversations and learn from one another. And when we talk about immigration and we have these very difficult conversations, not just here, but in our communities and with folks that don't necessarily agree with, with whatever your position is, you're having that conversation. And with good information and good journalism, I think those conversations can produce uh, some some sort of a uh, middle middle ground or some sort of outcome that's best for the country. Right now, I think uh, the the way things are, I, I don't think this is us as a country. I don't think what's happening at the border is us. I don't think that the way that that families right now, even internally, are being hunted by our own administration is us. I don't think that separating mixed status families or any families is us. Um, so I do find hope that there are a lot of people that are interested in this issue to learn, even to learn more about it, but, but maybe some people are interested enough to do something about it. Um, and that's where I come in. I'm optimistic in a couple ways. I think that you know, as somebody who's cared a lot about this issue for a long time, been covering it for a long time, and in many ways felt like I was shouting into the void about it for a long time, people are paying attention now more than ever before, which doesn't just mean that I cover policies of, the, of this administration and the ways in which things are changing now, but I actually can cover issues that were problems five years ago. Uh, major issues five years ago that I, I could have written about, and at the time, immigration really was a niche issue, and now it's a central issue. So some of the stories, just for example, that I've written about unaccompanied minors and facilities where they're held, you know, health and safety issues that go back more than a decade, and now those stories are read by millions of people, and, and just quite frankly, had I written them five years ago, they would have been written about, or they would have been read by you know a couple thousand people. So I noticed that, um, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that people are paying more attention and, and writing as much as I can. Uh, about long-standing issues. Uh, I also, especially, you know, this has been reinforced this week, being on campus and meeting with journalists, young journalists, um, I think that the industry is changing a lot, and we're basically here talking about a lot of stuff that could be better about journalism, and I think that's warranted, and that's good, but 
it's also improving. It's improved dramatically just since I've been involved in the industry. I think we at the Times have many conversations and within the national outlets have, are having many conversations about you know, who is our audience and paying more attention to writing for not just uh, not just one audience, but for people in different age groups, in different racial and ethnic backgrounds, from different immigration statuses. Um, and I think that's a really valuable thing, is that we're slowly becoming a more representative institution. Um, and again, again, doing all this additional work to educate the public about what we do so that we're, we're in a position to inform and ultimately empower people. That's it. Yeah. Um, so before I started covering a lot of immigration, I was covering a lot of criminal justice issues. And you know, the two kind of sit side by side, sometimes dovetail. And in criminal justice, the word is local, right? Everything is local. You go from one jurisdiction to the next, it's a totally different experience. Uh, and I'm seeing, you know, some of the things that are giving me hope is the way that's becoming in immigration policy issues. Of course, there's the national policies set by the Trump administration and others. But then locally, you know, the sanctuary cities movement, efforts in different cities to change how uh, ICE works with the police departments, for example, efforts to change the detention centers in areas. You know, a lot of detention centers aren't, you know, at the border. They're in rural Illinois or rural Michigan. Um, and so these are really local issues, so I'm, I'm hopeful in seeing, you know, more attention to how this is a local issue, what people locally can do about it if they have an opinion about it. Uh, so I think that that's really interesting and compelling, and I want to keep watching that. That's, that's a fascinating, fascinating point, because, you know, if you, if you look at even the state of Wisconsin is not having the same immigration conversations that seem to be happening at the national level. And if you go to different pockets, different communities within Wisconsin, that the narrative changes dramatically. So that's a, that's a really, really fascinating point. Okay, I have a few more questions, but I promised that I was going to keep this short so they could open it up for your questions. But I'm going to I'm going to tie it back to something we teach in our classes and something Caitlin referenced before, and that is that um, specificity matters. And so um, I'd like to encourage questions, not statements, um, as succinct as possible, so that we can get responses from them. So if our fine fellows are going to come around with uh, microphones, so if you just put your hand up, if you have a question, um, they're going to come and bring the microphone um, to you. So who is the question? separate, like I feel like right now, especially with immigration, it's really sad, like it can be heavy, and I like worry like, oh, the future in journalism, like covering topics like politics and stuff can be really, like it could just weigh you down a little bit, so how do you guys like find the balance, like when you go home and like you're talking to a friend, like, how do you kind of put your brain to rest on the topic? Journalism is an industry that regardless of the topic that you're covering, I think, requires a lot of empathy and a lot of just emotional energy. It's very draining work. To do a good job, to write a good story, you really have to put yourself in the shoes of your subjects. And you know, I talk a lot about how as journalists, how lucky we are to um, get access to people's most intimate, most intense moments of their lives. Sometimes they're the best moments of their lives, but often they're the worst moments of their lives. And um, so that's an intense experience. I think that you know what can be helpful is knowing how much a difference journalism can make, how impactful and how powerful it can be, and you know how important ultimately your role is as a, uh, somebody who is coming in, um, you know, of sound mind, <laughs> of clear and sound mind, to be able to convey these powerful experiences to the general public. You you can't do it if you're sort of you know a, a pile of tears. You can't do your job. And um, 
the other advice that I give, it, it, it's sort of a joke, but when people say, you know, like, how do you deal with all the depressing stories that you hear every day? And I say, like, eat salad and, like, get a good <laughs> night's sleep. And I, I know it doesn't really make sense. It's just become a joke because I realize how bizarre it sounds. But truly, like, you have to take really good care of yourself physically. Um, but I think that's the first step to taking good mental and psychological care of yourself in order to be able to do right by your sources. Because ultimately, you know, they're the ones who are really um, struggling. They're the ones who are really going out on a limb by being willing to tell you their stories, and so what you owe them is taking care of yourself so that you can tell their stories and do them justice. I think I would just add that, you know, secondary trauma is real in journalism, especially among journalists who cover these issues, uh, immigration, criminal justice, all the um, terrible things you can see, terrible stories you can see. Taking care of yourself, definitely a must. Also understanding the difference you know, what is your role exactly as a journalist? You're not a therapist, you're not a social worker. It can often feel like you, when you hear someone's story, you take on their burden. Um, and you know, that's what a good empathetic person does. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's not your role to be a therapist or to find them services necessarily or to, um, you know, be their lawyer. You have a very specific role. And so trying to keep that clear in your mind uh, I think helps a lot, and knowing that there's other people out there, it's not just all on you, there's other people out there in the world who are working on these issues too, uh, is, is helpful, I know, for myself and my team. Okay, better question. We've got um, one way up there, and then we'll go next down here. Sorry, you're looking. So let's say you write the story and it's specific and it's perfect. I knew people writing out of Chile during Allende's time where they wrote the story, but at the editorial level it was changed to actually create quite a different story. To what extent have you run into those kinds of editorial issues? And if you have, what do you do? Issues where editors change stories. Um so this, is, this came up in a few different classes. You know, what if somebody makes a change in your story and you're not comfortable with it? And, and um, you know, I think probably nobody's stories are edited more than New York Times stories. There, there are people who I've never even heard of, you know, who I'm like just checking to make sure they actually have a New York Times email who are sending me notes with, with opinions on my work. I mean, the layers of, the layers of opinion sometimes um, are just profound. But, um, you never publish anything that you're not comfortable with. I, you, and I always have an opportunity to voice discomfort or, or to address inaccuracies if they make their way into stories, you know, it, but from well-meaning editors who might not know as much about the topic as I do. Um, you know, it, it's, it's part of the process. Anybody who's worked in a newsroom knows that when somebody's tinkering in your story and they're making changes, they could, you know, through no fault of their own, um, again, in a well-meaning way, accidentally tweak a story in a way that renders it inaccurate. And so it's part of the process, something that you deal with, and, and certainly nothing that has ever um, been a problem that's actually made it to publication in my case. I mean, the, the process of, you know, having a story edited and then, go, and then having the writer go back over it at the end to make sure that everything is still correct is something that is, is baked into the process, at least in my experience. But it's not always in a well-meaning way, right? I mean, sometimes, I think probably much more common at the local level, not at the, the Times or the Post or the Journal, but, you know, it, that's a place for other layers of implicit bias to come in uh, to the story construction. So, you know, one of the things I hear quite often from journalists are complaints that, um, well, I don't really emphasize conflict in my reporting, but by the time it goes through two layers of editors, whammo, conflict is the big thing that's played out, and that's the, that's the dominant frame. So it can be a place that bias slips into the story, even if the reporter was, you know, absolutely perfect, right? And we have one here in the front. I know, we'll go back up there. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wondering if there is a way to push non-journalists with large platforms to think about ethics and adopt style guides. 
Can you give an example? Uh, well, so for example, uh, in political science, some political scientists have large Twitter followings, and um, even people on the left might use uh, illegal as a noun, uh, despite you apparently have dealt with this a long time ago, NPR, whatever the APA stuff. How do you, I think the question, I'm, I'm going I'm to reframe what you say, how, and I think it's a fascinating, it's something that we wrestle with a lot in the work that we do, how do we extend journalism ethics to so these questions of truthfulness, of minimizing harm, how do we extend that beyond the realm of journalism into, you know, God forbid, academia, <laughs> but advocacy is a really good, is a really good example, maybe you, Armando, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. You know, ad advocates can become very uh, strident in the way that they communicate. Should they be thinking about framing in the same way journalism journalists do? That's a really uh, social movement organizations are going to frame their message the way they're going to frame their message, uh, and that's just sometimes they they clash with other social movement like like mission social movement organizations, right? Um, even though that they're all working towards probably the same type of societal change. In this case, um, you might have difference of opinion with what, you know, this organization, BOSIS, is doing in Milwaukee, with what Traisis is doing in Texas, or what have you, uh, and how they communicate to, to, to their followers and their members. Um, you know, but, but I don't think there's the same style of, like, guiding principles that you all have. Um, with regards to the way those messages are, are put out. Um, I know that, that the media, um, the, the press releases that come out of these social movement organizations have a, a very intentional, um, a very intentional purpose for going out the way they do. For example, like if we have a sanctuary case and it needs to go public, because sanctuary cases, when the person seeks sanctuary, Right, sanctuary from, from deportation, and there's a, and we know that in the past there's been, a, well, even today, there's there's a different churches that, that have said we can give folks sanctuary here. We're ready to take these people in. Part of that sanctuary is to go public, right? Not necessarily protect this person's story, but to tell this person's story, to uh, be able to create that narrative, to protect, to give this person and their families protection. So um, in that sense, I, I think it's kind of anti, anti what we're talking about with regards to anonymity and all that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think I answered your question because I didn't. <laughs> I'll say I agree with Katie that I think everybody can benefit from journalistic, journalism ethics, not just journalists. Um, you know, I think there are ways in which I've never worked as an advocate, but it's probably not the most effective way to achieve your goal. Um, to follow the exact same rules that journalists do, but when you look at you know, journalism ethics, a lot of them are basic values that we as a society um, have always uh, upheld or always talked about intending to uphold. I mean, things like accuracy, things like fairness, things like uh, the spread of information in a democratic way. I mean, these are kind of basic American values, and I'm not going to argue that we've ever necessarily lived up to them, but they're things that as a society, people value. So I don't know what to do other than to encourage people to read um, some of the better books about journalism ethics. I find them very fascinating. Um, but short of that, I mean, I think that you're more familiar as a political scientist with these values than you realize, because they are things that are as simple as be truthful, uh, share information democratically and equitably. Things like that. <coughs> so social movement organizations that, that I've seen are successful are the ones that gain the trust of the people they're organizing and trust of their allies. Um, and, you know, if we're talking about just basic elements of, of how an organization acts, then they're basic elements of building trust and building relationships with the folks that you're, that you're organizing. So truthfulness in, is, 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 is primary, but also... Um, being genuine and being clear about what your goals are with regards to any type of campaign or, or which way you're moving forward. Uh, but, but yeah. I'm going to make myself into a pretend panelist for a second and add one other point. <laughs> um, and that is that journalism is catastrophically bad 
and opening itself up and talking about the reasons we make the decisions we want to make. And the reasons they make the decisions they make. I don't work in a newsroom anymore. Um, but I think it comes from just counting on that blind faith for years that, oh, we have the public's trust. We don't say why we have made the decision to use the language that we use, for instance. I would love to see news organizations doing a lot more to extend the ethics practices that they use, like how you term a person who is in the United States without permission or without permission yet, um, and challenge some of the um, some of the advocates or the pundits that we see. And there are places you do see it, and I think the publisher of the New York Times in the last six months in particular has been very good at calling out people who subvert truth in, in the public sphere. That, that's great. Um, but you'll see um, um, the, the Associated Press, for instance, will the, the celebrity tweets about someone, quote unquote, committing suicide. The Associated Press will tweet at them and say, the preferred terminology is die by suicide because it's not a crime. You commit a crime, you die from something. And so I'd love to see more of that, of news organizations and individual journalists challenging people who are putting information into the public sphere that violates some sense of those values. Okay, another question. Oh gosh, lots, okay. So we've got one way up there, bubble right there, and then we'll go up in the middle back there, and then down here to Sam. Um, I guess I have more of a statement than a question, but you can reframe it in a question if possible. But since we're talking about morals and ethics when it comes to immigration, why do you suppose we don't talk about the millions of undocumented Canadians here? Why do you suppose we refer to Americans who have left the country as expats? And why do we never talk about immigrants who have come from Central South America who are of median and upper class, who are scholars, who are educated, who are doctors? Why do you suppose those people are left out of the conversation? Well, I, I think that uh, the short answer is because we racialize uh, a certain type of person to be a certain type of immigrant. And by a certain type of person, we're talking about, you know, in, in the last hundred years, at least the relationship with Mexico has been creating that other with regards to this, uh, this preferred and non-preferred person that we want to be part of, part of our country. Uh, I think Right now, we're living through a moment, and we talk quite about quite about this quite a lot, but not enough, is that we're living through, um, we're undergoing a demographic shift as a country. And I think that right there is the antagonism that we're seeing this resurgence of how we're talking about these newcomers coming from uh, coming from Mexico and Central America. Um, it's this, this antagonism that I see that plays out in the media is, is this the demographic shift that we're predicting that by 2065, 33% of, of, of our population is going to be Latino, Latina, or Latinx. Um, and I think that plays itself in real uh, anxieties throughout our country, in the Midwest, or what have you. We're not talking about building a wall with, you know, around Canada. We're talking about building a wall between Mexico and the US, as symbolic as it is, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it, we, when we talk about this in class, we do talk about the racialized understanding of how we place people within our, higher, within our taxonomy, a hierarchy in our country, based on what we um, socially constructed as we're of human value. I think you bring up really good points. I actually just wrote a piece about language, and we've talked about a lot of it tonight, but a piece about language and, and the words that people use when they're talking about immigration and how actually it's really difficult to write about immigration in a way that's non-divisive or that doesn't play into stereotypes because almost all of the language that exists to talk about immigration in this country is, is playing into, to a certain degree, um, political persuasions. There are very few truly neutral words that can be used. You know, I, in that piece, I wrote that how frequently, I, I pose the question, how frequently do you hear people who um, were born abroad referred to in the US as foreigners? I mean, we don't really refer to foreigners in our stories either. A friend of mine who's a Times correspondent, she I've been covering immigration with me and she just moved to Beirut and she's now covering the Middle East and she was talking about this expat question and 
how she's been referring to friends of hers who, you know, went on summer vacation from Europe to Lebanon and never turned around, and, you know, she talks about them as undocumented migrant laborers. Um, she's, you know, <laughs> updating her friends on her experience living in, in Lebanon. We're laughing because it's, it's counterintuitive because so many of these words, like you, like you bring up, they, they play into and perpetuate stereotypes. So it, it's funny for us to think about, you know, a French student who's in Lebanon and who's working in a grocery store, or who's teaching English as an undocumented seasonal migrant laborer. But it's, you know, there's a reason that, that we're laughing about that. So I think those are really good points. At the same time, I do want to point out that, you know, I think, and we have, we've done stories might have to Google that, but we have done stories about, you know, people who are undocumented from Canada, about people who overstay visas who come from East and South Asia in higher numbers than a lot of people expect. But we're also, we're talking a lot right now about folks coming from Central America because they are the vast majority, not only of people coming to the United States, but people who are impacted by these new, um, new and dr dramatically different policies that are being introduced. And so you do have to sort of address that as a journalist, and that's why you see a disproportionate number, or what, what might seem on its face like a disproportionate number of stories about those populations oppo as opposed to the Canadians that you, that you bring up. Is there up there in the middle? If you could just pass the mic down, that would be great. Can you please share some solid examples of a time when you earn the trust of someone who's really reluctant to share their story, or um, earning the trust of maybe a community where you were not a part of? Yeah, um, I would share, so if, if you go out that way, um, in addition to our ethics guideline posters, which you are free to take in stickers, uh, we have some examples of a special issue we did last year on undocumented community immigrants in a little village in Chicago, which is a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. It's predominantly Mexican immigrants, um, but it's a really thriving neighborhood. It has the second largest commercial district uh, after Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And it was a hard neighborhood to get into. Uh, you know, my co-reporters for the, the stories, some of them um, spoke fluent Spanish, so that wasn't an issue. Some of them were of Mexican heritage, so that wasn't as much of an issue. But the real issue was the, the distrust of media. Uh, that community has been hit hard in the past uh, by media portrayal of them, um, be it you know, as an area with a lot of gun violence, or in an area, you know, after Trump was elected, there were a lot of news stories in Chicago and elsewhere that all these raids were impending. Um, and that stoked a lot of fears around people in not just Chicago, but the nearby Indiana, Wisconsin, people who are coming from miles and miles to shop in Little Village, they stopped coming because of fears. And a lot of the blame for that uh, and the commercial losses that those stores hit were placed on the media. So there was a big distrust going into it, and it really took months of meeting with people, talking to people, and approaching it from all different angles. So, for instance, one angle we did was we partnered with a youth uh, journalism organization in the neighborhood and asked the teenagers to go around the neighborhood and take pictures of what they think immigration means in their neighborhood. So seeing it through their lens, uh, not just ours. Another example was really, uh, we do a lot of these as told to stories, which are kind of like oral histories, but um, in that we do an interview with someone, we turn it into just their words, and then usually we share it back with them and say, are there any changes you would like to make? You know, what, what here makes you feel safe? What makes you feel not safe? And really thinking through the, the security issue again, um, and helping them think through, okay, actually this phrase could you get you in trouble if someone reads this. Um, so doing that and really taking the time uh, and then the third way we got into the issue was I worked with a comic artist of Mexican heritage who her family was all across the border um, undocumented. She was born in the U.S. But it was a personal issue for her and we worked together to produce this comic explainer 
about a gang database that the Chicago Police Department was using, and it was a way um, in to supposedly for the police department to find out who are gang members in Chicago, um, and they would also share that information with ICE. So, uh, the, of course, the da database was had a lot of problems, and oh, a lot of uh, black and Latino men were on there who should not have been. Um, and so it was kind of going through that, that process. So it's a mixture of time involving the community in really visible and actionable ways. And um, t being able to take no. Sometimes you work with a source for months and months and they say, you know what, no, I can't do this. I, this is just too much for my family. I can't put my family through this. Uh, and you have to accept that. And that you know sucks to have worked so long on a story and have it fall through, but it happens, and you have to, you know, respect someone's uh, ability to say yes or no when they're talking to you. Caitlin, I'm thinking back to the story that we were talking about this afternoon, where a source comes to trust you, and then reveals something that can be very difficult for you. And I think back to the, we're not social service agents, we're not your minister. Um, so sometimes when you build that trust, can it turn? Can it, can it make it more difficult for you? It can potentially, I, I actually, the example that we were talking about this morning or this afternoon, I feel like is a little bit different in that um, this was, this is a basically a different ethical question, I think, uh, facing reporters, which is, I, just, I thought it was incredibly timely. I just got back from Texas, I was going back and forth um, between Montemoros and Brownsville and McAllen, and I went up to Laredo and I was interviewing a bunch of people to basically get a sense of it. I interviewed both people who are waiting on the Mexican side of the border to try to enter the United States, and I also spent the day with the Border Patrol to see how their jobs have changed under the, the latest uh, asylum policies that have been introduced. And um, I mean, talk about ethical quandaries. There was a woman who sent me a text message this morning, and she's um, in Montemoros, and she sends me a message saying, like, I'm just <coughs> so uh, exhausted. I can't take it anymore. I think I'm going to cross the Rio Grande. So, She's telling me that she's about to do something that is not only incredibly dangerous, but is also against the law. And um, of course, I can have no part in giving her um, any feedback about what to do or how to proceed. And you know, I, I, in that case, I did go to my editor and just say, you know, this person has contacted me and said this, and what do you think? This is really tough. I mean, I feel like that's sort of as tough as it gets for me. Um, the fact is, you know, when I was there, I spent actually quite a lot of time with this woman and the people living around her, and there are many advocates, aid workers, American aid workers and Mexican aid workers who basically are spending their days discouraging people from crossing the river because it's so incredibly dangerous. The week before I was there, um, a, a parent and child drowned just feet from where this woman is, is living in a tent, and I had written about another parent and child several months earlier who died the same way. So. She's aware of the safety risks and, and ultimately has to make that decision for herself. But you know, these are very high stakes things that people are, are um, you know, and truly I think in these situations, folks don't have a whole lot of people to talk to. And so I'm somebody who they've talked to recently, who they've opened up to and who they feel close to. And so my responsibility in that moment, I mean, going back to your question about sort of the role of the journalist is, is sometimes to remind people that, um, you're, you, you can't help them. I mean, your, your role is to tell their story. You can't influence their decisions in a, in a direct way, and, and ultimately it's up to her. But I, I think it was okay for me in that moment to remind her of the advice that she had gotten when she and I were together from aid workers who were saying, this is very dangerous, and you know, she, she's pregnant, so the risk is even higher. Um, but it it's, it's, can get really tough at times. Okay, we've got time for one more question. So we're going to go here in the middle, the Wisconsin cut. So I'm kind of interested in something that um, Ms. Degerson mentioned before, in that you've been covering this beat for decades, or very, very long time, and now we're at, we're only now we're at the point where you feel like people are paying attention. So my question is, are you guys, as journalists and as activists and scholars, concerned about the level of apathy in our society? 
Like, are you concerned that something takes rising to a level like this to get people to actually start paying attention? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was looking, uh, just at some stuff on the internet, and, uh, and all these news stories popped up of, of children dying in detention centers, right? Six children within like the, the last six months or last year or what have you. Uh, I looked at the deaths of the, the, the mounting deaths of people crossing the border. I think in the last 10 or 15 years, it's up to uh, close to 10,000 people that have actually died, between seven and 10,000 people that have died crossing the border into the US. Many of them to go unnamed, un, unclaimed. You know, I look at, at mixed status families um, here in Wisconsin, right, that are being separated in, in the case where, you know, one of the family members is unauthorized, there's a U.S. citizen, and some other family member with, with some sort of, um, some sort of authorization. That, that concerns me uh, as well. I think that, that we're tearing apart the very fabric of our, of our communities and, um, and aren't, aren't really paying attention to the long-term consequences consequences to, to, to us all, right? This is immigration and the immigrant question, as we're, we're referring to it, it's not just about immigrants, but it's about all of us, um, and all of us and how we see ourselves as a, as a, as a, as a society um, that, that's hopefully around for a while. Um, so yeah, it, it, it concerns me to see the level of, of, of apathy and not the larger levels of, that, of empathy. I think there is a lot of apathy, but I also, again, like I said earlier, I do try to be sympathetic. I think people are really overwhelmed with information overload right now, and we probably, as journalists right now, are not doing the best job of curating um, and specifying for them what is actually most important and impactful, and hopefully we'll get better at that, because that's sort of the number one piece of feedback that I get is like, you're just throwing way too much at us. And so I try to be reasonable and understand again that really first and foremost, 99% of energy goes toward taking care of yourself and taking care of your family and going to work and paying your bills. And anything beyond that is, is extra. So I try to think about ways that I can do better, um, be clearer, be more concise, be more uh, thoughtful in the stories that I choose to tell so that I, I really make them count. I think the only thing I would add is something that Armando brought up earlier is, you know, yes, there's been a lot of visible tragedies and it's been a hard few years in that way. Uh, but also there's also more, you know, inward looking at, I see people doing it, and trying to understand how does this issue impact them and how is the American government helping displace some of these people who are coming. What is our role you know, as citizens, as taxpayers, in producing some of this immigration, producing some of these asylum seekers, or the conditions at least, that make them asylum? Okay, I'm not an asylum seeker, but this impacts me in this So I think I, I think respection is always a problem. There's so much it's so easy just to and very that is important. And I, I'm again help, hopeful about the movement towards solutions and peace journalism and giving people some actionable steps to address all of the tragedies that are thrown at us every day. All right, well, I'd like you all to please join me in thanking our tremendous panelists. For this <laughs> These are not small issues that they cover and their time is so valuable, so sharing with us, I'm, I'm deeply grateful. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of you for, for coming out here. Uh,
Um, some, some of you are students, some of you are journalists, and some of you are interested in the work of journalism. You, you don't touch it, but um, you don't do it, but um, I like to think you benefit from it, and I like to think that you challenge it to, to be better and to rise. Um, to that end, we do have some good resources for you um, at the Center for Journalism Ethics. That's our little URL up there. If you want to take a little picture of it. Um, a lot of the issues that were raised tonight have been explored in different ways through this center's fellows' work. Um, uh, I'll point to Natalie Yarn here, the fellow in the middle, who's written a really tremendous um, guide to less extractive reporting, so um, trying to do journalists engaging in practices that just don't just go in and take from sources and then leave, but how can we actually engage and do better. I'd also like to point out that our um, every spring we have a big ethics conference, and um, this year, our ethics conference is the last Friday in April, and it's going to be on ethics and the crisis in local news. We've touched on that in a few different ways uh, tonight, and I think it's going to be a really um, intriguing uh, conversation. It might be a little depressing at times, but we like to um, end with that spot of optimism. So with all of that, thank you very much for being here tonight, and I hope to see you all back in April. <laughs>